Howdy, good day. My name is Helen. I belong to from the Frog Clan from the Clayton Tene Nation. On behalf of Chief Dominic Frederick and Council, I officially welcome you to the Clayton Tene Traditional Territory. Dear Creator, we give you thanks for another day and ask for your guidance to start our day with a new attitude and plenty of gratitude. Amen. Howdy, my name is Colette Plasway. I am from the Lake Babi Nation. I am currently working with the Carrier Sakani Family Services. I previously worked for the now disbanded Northern HIV Coalition, where I learned how to provide education and training in the communities. Today I'm going to talk about STIs, hepatitis C, how is it transmitted, and how to use a condom, um, both male and female. Uh, we do have another video that's linked down below that talks about HIV, the HIV transmission equation, and we'll have a personal story about uh, a person that has HIV. What is an STI? It's a sexually transmitted infection. Um, it's something that is passed from one person to the next. So how does a person get STIs? They generally get it through unprotected sex, uh, unprotected sexual contact with somebody who has who is already infected, and they transfer it to their sexual partner. And it's kind of the same as HIV. It's something that can be passed on to a next person, even if they aren't showing any symptoms. So that's why we encourage people to get tested regularly. Um, STIs are spread uh, during vaginal, anal, or oral sex. And what's important is that it could actually be transmitted um, without even uh, sexual intercourse, um, because like I said, it can pass through oral sex. 
Can STIs cause health problems? Yes, they can. Um, if left untreated, STIs can cause pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, pregnancy, and sometimes even cancer, which we'll explain later. So the top STIs that we're going to cover um, is gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia. Gonorrhea is a disease that is most common with teenagers, and it uh, ha the symptoms are usually discharges and uh, pain in the stomach. Syphilis is kind of like open sores that don't heal, and that's again in the genital areas. And chlamydia causes a swelling in the lymph nodes. So if you want to know what lymph nodes are, those are basically you get swelling in the, in the throat, in the, behind the ears, or in the jaw. Um, and that is passed on from one person to the next. So the key symptoms of any STIs are usually general discomfort or discharge in the genital area. And many of the STIs, unfortunately, don't have really big symptoms. So that's why it's good to get tested regularly. Uh, and, it's, and the general rule of thumb is to get an STI testing when you have your regular checkup. So basically, when you go for your STI testing, you, you ask, They'll have to check off on the on a slip everything that you want to get tested for. And the other important thing is that they can't test you for HIV unless you ask for it or hepatitis C. You have to ask for it. So that's important distinction when you're getting tested. Um, another part of the STI screening that um, will occur is with pelvic and physical examination. Your doctor will look for certain things like signs, warts, rashes, or discharge. Sometimes they'll ask for a blood sample or a urine sample, or in um, more chronic situations, they might f ask for a fluid or a tissue sample. And we'll kind of explain that later on when we're talking about hepatitis C. So what is hepatitis? Uh, hep hepar in hepatitis means liver. And itis means inflammation. So put together, hepatitis means the inflammation of the liver. Um, so in minor cases, it just it might inflame the liver. But as the hepatitis progresses, it could cause scarring in, in the liver, which is called fibrosis. And in some cases, cirrhosis, which means that their blood can't access your liver. Um, so that's more of a chronic case of hepatitis. So the three most common hepatitis is, uh, are A, B, and C. I know that sounds like um, you're doing your alphabets. So the common symptoms of HIV or hepatitis is most people don't experience any symptoms for several years, which is um, a caution, which is a concern for most health professionals because they want you to get tested regularly. So what is hepatitis B? Hepatitis B, as with all hepatitis, hep affects the liver and is transmitted by blood-to-blood -blood contact only or unprotected sex or using needles that haven't been sterilized. 95% uh, of hepatitis B adult patients can get rid of it on their own, and for those that can't get rid of it on their own, it could become chronic. And if it does become chronic, unfortunately, it means that they'll be on medication for the rest of their lives. Um, fortunately for us, it's not very common in Canada. So what is kind of common in northern BC, or just um, in general, is hepatitis C. It seems to have gotten, um, ha the incidences seem to have risen more than HIV. Um, hepatitis C, as with all hepatitis, is, affects the liver and can be transferred when blood interacts with uh, another person's blood. Um, so that means that it could be transmitted from people sharing uh, drug equipment. Or if you had a, a blood transfusion or organ transplant before 1992, um, you should 
uh, get tested for it because uh, if you got any of those two things before 1992, your blood was the blood that they used for the for the um, transplant or the transfusion weren't tested for HIV or hepatitis C. So there's a good, if you got any of those two things before 1992, please go get tested. The less common ways of getting hepatitis C is through sharing personal items such as razors, toothbrush, or nail clippers. But good thing is that it's less common to get hepatitis C. Or another way is through un sharing unsterilized needles or um, piercing with unsterilized needles. Um, having unprotected sex where blood is present or having a hepatitis C positive parent or positive mother transferring it to her child or having unprotected sex with somebody who has HIV. And the reason is because when somebody has HIV, they have less um, they have less chance of um, fighting off any diseases, so they're more susceptible to getting hepatitis C if they already have HIV. Now, what kind of treatment can you get if you have uh, hepatitis C? Now, 25% of people who have hepatitis C can get rid of it on their own, which is great. 50% um, of people who have hepatitis C don't realize they have it, kind of like HIV. Um, the reason is because it, the symptoms don't show up for a long time, so that's why they think that they're healthy, but they don't realize they actually have hepatitis C and they could actually spread it. Um, and those with chronic hepatitis C will be asked if they want to take more tests, and the reason that they have to do more tests, and they're going to be different than blood tests, they're going to look for um, a, a liver scan. They're going to look for a liver scan to find out if there's any, what, what kind of damage they have in the liver. Um, and they're also going to have to do a, take out a tissue sample of your liver to find out what kind of uh, hepatitis you have. Because there's six type of genomes uh, of hepatitis C that a person can have. So the reason that you have to undergo all those tests is to find out what kind of hepatitis C you have, and then they'll have medication specific to that hepatitis C that the person can get. So the good thing is that a person can um, get, get treatment, and it only lasts about three months. The only thing of caution is that if you have hepatitis C, you still can get it get reinfected with hepatitis. And sometimes the government won't cover your medication if you're reinfected, but a social worker can help you to get your medication covered, but it's just gonna take a lot of paperwork for it. When you get hepatitis C and you get cured from it, there's still a chance that a person could get cancer. So what are the famous people that have hepatitis C, which kind of um, surprised me was Naomi Judd got it um, through a needle prick when she was a nurse. Uh, Pamela Anderson got it when she got a got a bad tattoo from an unsterilized tattoo needle. And the other person which surprised me was the lead singer from Aerosmith, Steve Tyler. He got it and has been living with it for more than 11 years. Hepatitis C um, transmission. So what are the bodily fluids that transmit HIV or hepatitis C? Um, there's only one body fluid that transmits hepatitis C and that's blood. Um, the other bodily fluids that can transmit a hepatitis C is only when blood is present. Only. And that's only vaginal fluid or anal fluid when having rough sex or when there are open sores in a genital area. Um, the other one is if, if a baby is having a feeding from a mother that has uh, her nipples are sore or there's open sores on her nipples, it, if a person who has hepatitis C, she could possibly transmit it to her baby through, through her breast milk because there might be blood present. Um, and like HIV, hepatitis C can only be transmitted from person to person. 
And kind of like HIV, there's uh, direct openings that can uh, transmit hepatitis C, like sex from the friction of the penis or a mouth, or a sex toy can uh, cause tiny rips in the mucous membranes, which allows blood to enter into your body. So that would cover oral, anal, vaginal, um, penis or a pee hole, or occupational exposure, like Naomi Jett got it through a needle prick, uh, skin piercing or tattooing. So again, it's advisable for a person to get um, hepatitis C test or to get skin piercing or tattooing through a tattoo artist. Um, the big difference between HIV and hepatitis C is that hepatitis C can last up to six days outside of the body. Unlike HIV that survives only four minutes outside of the body, hepatitis C could actually last a lot longer outside of the body for six days or a lot longer inside of a needle. So that's why it's um, advisable for people who are injection drug users to uh, go to a needle exchange program regularly to get fresh needles so that they don't share their needles and pass on their such STIs to another person. So what does not transmit hepatitis C? So as explained before, a person who has hepatitis C can look normal and uh, may not themselves know that they have hepatitis C and have a chance of spreading it to another person. So hepatitis C, hepatitis C cannot be transmitted through sweat, saliva, or tears, much like HIV. So it's safe to shake hands with somebody who has hepatitis C. It's safe to hug somebody who has hepatitis C. And you could use the same toilet or drink from the same glass. And like hepatitis C, it doesn't survive in cats or dogs or mosquito bites. So next we're going to demonstrate how to do the floor exercise. So Viewers might be confused about the floor exercise only because they might not have received the Healthy Sexuality Kit, which was distributed to the Northern BC First Nation communities. So if you received a kit, you might want to know what, how, to, how do you use these activity cards. So we're going to do a quick demonstration of how to use it. So what you want to do is you take your cards and you hand it out to your lovely participants. Usually you have more than two, but um, this is just a demonstration. So what you do is you take your number of cards. I would recommend not using all 40 cards or else it's gonna to take too long to do the exercise. So what I would advise is that you take, you give each participant um, one to three cards. Three cards is the maximum because otherwise the participants are going to get too um, confused. So leave it to up to three cards per person. But in this demonstration, I'm going to go over that limit. So take your cards and hand it out to your lovely participants. And what you do is you ask them um, to look at their cards, take a minute for them to, get them to take a minute to look at their cards and then ask them this question. Does the activity that they have, does it transmit hepatitis C? So place your yes, maybe, and no cards down and then ask your participants with their cards um, to look at it. Does that activity transmit hepatitis C? And give them some time to look through it and make sure you let them know that there is no right or wrong answer. It doesn't matter. This is a learning experience. And um, ask them to put it under, if that activity um, passes hepatitis C, it goes under the yes. If it's in a maybe, go under maybe. And if it's a no, put it under the no pile. So, and the other question that we get asked a lot is, how can you tell what the eagles are doing? What you do is you look behind the picture and it tells, it says in words what they're doing. So go ahead. So after the, particip the lovely participants put their cards down, 
go to the yes call yes pile and pick pick all the cards up and as a group you ask you ask the whole participants um, getting a tattoo yes no and usually they say yes sharing needles is that past hepatitis E yes because of blood mother breastfeeding does that pass on hepatitis C yes if there's blood present sharing a crack pipe does it transmit hepatitis C yes um, as explained in the HIV video uh, blood can be or present when sharing a crack pipe because the mouth is um, really dry and the lips can crack and um, expose the the crack pipe to blood so yes it can snorting drugs the same principle um, the mucous membranes will rip and when sharing a uh, snorting drugs so what we do is we ask people to use the, their own straw vaginal sex if it's unprotected sex yes sharing piercing equipment yes because um, blood is present and if they didn't um, sterilize the needles before sharing a toothbrush yes um, it's actually more on the maybe side but we'll say yes today uh, the reason is because hepatitis C can last up to six days. So then you go to the other pile. If there's nothing under maybe, you skip on to your no pile. Does fighting transmit hepatitis C? Only if there's lots of blood present. So if there was a lot of blood present and it went into the eyes, then yes, it can transmit hepatitis C. But normally, no, it won't. So... I would put it under the maybe, uh, then under no, just because there might be loss of blood present. The next we're going to cover how to use a condom. So first we're going to demonstrate how to use a male, male condom. Um, the reason, one of the questions that we get asked a lot is when do we use a condom? Um, you would use it when the erection occurs, obviously, or you could use it before sexual contact. You actually need to use it on a sex toy, especially if you're using it with another sexual partner. Um, the reason for that is that you need to put a condom on the sex toy so that um, it, the, the, the sex toy might be rip the mucous membranes of your genital area, so that's why you need to be sure to use a condom for that as well. So the good rule of thumb is just to treat the sex toy as part of, just like the real thing. So uh, you would use a uh, condom for vaginal, anal, or oral sex. We're going to show both of those. And the important thing to know is to use a new condom for each sexual uh, interaction. Um, you can't use the same condom for two different interactions. You have to use one, a fresh one for each one. And the other thing that we get a lot in the communities is uh, men like to put a condom in their wallet and they think they're good to go, but actually, no. What happens is that if the condom is in the wallet, it's going to be in your back pocket and it's going to uh, make the condom package uh, squish and then there'll be no air in it and then it'll cause the condom to break because there's no air in it to keep it moist. So you, you would not want to avoid that. So how to use a con male condom. First you need to check the expiry date. Um, so this one is t October 2018 so we've got to make sure we're going to use it before Halloween. Um, check to make sure there's no holes in the condom package. So if it's nice and fluffy, then you're good to go. If it's flat, then you can't use it. You have to use a different one. So be careful when you're opening it. Uh, push it over to the side and then um, take the condom and carefully take it out, rip the, the thing over. Um, we, for Communities, we would actually recommend that they use a one condom uh, only because they're really good for education. Like these are glow in the darks. Glow in the darks, the teenagers love it. So I would recommend that they would really bring people to your booth. Just a PR um, thing for you. So what you want to do is when you open up the condom, 
This is from Puzzling North. I love it. They, their educators say, if it looks like a sombrero, then it's good to go on a penis. But if it looks like a toque, then that's the wrong way. So make sure that's a sombrero. Think Mexican. And then uh, make sure to pinch an inch. And then take the erect penis and roll it down carefully. And you want to make sure that there's no air in it. So that's the correct way to put on a condom. What we see a lot when we do this in the communities is that um, some people will think that they actually have to have air in it. So if you look on the, on the slide, on the right side, that's the wrong way. It's actually, it's, and the re reason it's wrong is that it has air in it. The right way is this way where there's no air in it. Um, so another question we get asked is, why do we have to pinch an inch when we put a condom on? The reason we want to pinch an inch is, uh, as Julius Akpati, our former educator, used to say, is when the love gun triggers. So what that means is that we have to have enough room in the condom for the semen to collect. Um, so once um, ejaculation occurs, you carefully take off the condom and then um, tie it up and throw it into the garbage, not in the toilet. Another good thing to know is, like I said, when you have, uh, when you want to have oral sex, um, you could actually uh, hack your, gen your regular condom and make it into a dental dam. So what you do is you unroll it like I did. This is a glow-in-the-dark condom, by the way. Take your scissors and cut off the end of the condom. And then um, it takes a little bit of work. but um, And then just split it down in the, uh, on the side with your scissors. Ooh, I ripped it, but that's OK. So you would take the gooey side, and that goes towards your partner. And then you could use the this side, like the gooey side goes on your partner, and then you're able to use it to provide oral sex to your partner. So that's a good trick to use. Um, you know, that way you don't have to go to the store to get a dental dam. But you can get dental dams in the drugstore if you want. So the use of lubricants. So we just talked about condom demonstration. So um, when you a question that we get asked a lot is what kind of lubricants can a person use with the latex condoms? Um, the kinds of condom lubricants that you should use are water-based uh, lubricants. So things like, um, I, we get a lot asked a lot, is KY lotion okay to use with the latex condom? And yes, it is safe because it's water-based. Uh, another one is the Durex condom. Uh, lubricants, they're safe as well because they're water-based with the condoms. So you're supposed to avoid oil-based lubricants um, with the latex condoms. Um, the reason is that the oil-based one lubricants will break your condoms and uh, expose pe people to sexually transmitted infections. So things like Vaseline, cold cream, hand lotion, baby oil, bear grease, oligan grease. <laughs> Thank you, Bambi Tate. That was funny. I love that. I use that every time in the communities. Um, so one, one of our educators was saying, well, who would use bear grease with lubricant? And she said, um, probably because they were just trying to make a joke. So thank you, Bambi Tate, for that. So use lots of lubricant with a standard condom when you're engaging in anal intercourse. Um, the reason for that is when you're engaging in anal intercourse, there is no natural lubricant to help with the, with the, um, with, with the intercourse. So it's good if you use lots of uh, lubricant. And that way, it, the other reason that you need to use lots of lubricant is because the lining of the rectum has a lot of uh, mucous membranes that can tear and rip without lubricant. So if a person is engaging in anal intercourse without protection, um, they're totally subject 
to getting STIs because of the tiny rips in the mucous and membranes. What I didn't know about female condoms, a lot of ladies don't want to use it because they think it looks ugly and they don't know how to use it. So I'm going to sh demonstrate how to use it anyway. But um, what's good about the female condom, and I think um, it's a good thing if you if you're allergic to latex, to use a female condom. That way, if either of your partners are uh, allergic to latex, then the woman can wear the female condom, and that way you could have uh, have protected sex. Um, and the reason that a female would want to use a female condom is so that they could have uh, they could actually use it before they go out, and if they think that they're going to get really drunk and they're they're not going to be um, conscious enough to put on a condom. Um, they could put this in before they go out, and it's good for about eight hours. Just like a tampon, it doesn't affect where you go to the washroom. This is actually part of your vagina, and the pee hole is in a different area. So it's safe for the lady to have it before she goes out. So just like a male condom, you check to see that it's... Um, if the, if the condom is uh, expired. It's different than with a male condom. Male condom actually provide, it actually says expired, whereas the female condom that you might get at a clinic, it's not gonna tell you that the expiry date. So what you do is you look in the back and it'll have a date, and that's the date that it expires. I know that that's confusing. You'll find it there, right in the back, there's a date on it, and um, that's the expiry date. I'd, so kind of like the other condom, you squish it to one side, and then you open it carefully, and um, you open it up, and it looks confusing at first, but you'll see that there's a closed side, which has a ring and then an open side. So what you do is, if, you, if the woman knows how to insert a tampon, it's basically the same principle. Um, you could warm it up if you want. So just like I said, it was, it's a basic principle of um, putting a tampon on. You find the inner ring and you squish it, and then you insert, you, you just like in the tampon um, directions, you have to squat and do that whole thing and then put it, insert it gently into your vagina. And then make sure that this part is uh, outside of your body for the penis later. So after ejaculation, exactly like the male condom, you take it out gently and then you tie it and then you put it into the washroom, not in the toilet or else you're going to clog it up. One of the good discussions topics that communities can have is what are the reasons that men or women give for not using a condom? Usually men will say that they want to have the natural feel and they also want to say that how could you not trust me that I'm not going to fool around with anybody, I'm only dedicated to you. But it's important to, to um, if, if, if a couple wants to decide not to use a condom then maybe uh, have both of you guys have sex, uh, STI testing. Ask for HIV and hepatitis C. That way you know that you're good to go and um, you're not going to pass anything on to each other. Otherwise, if you're not sure and you don't want to do the STIs, then we would, survive, we would suggest that you um, wear a condom uh, before having sex. Another um, discussion topic that we that we get a lot in the communities is um, girls in the communities think that if a guy buys them drinks or drugs that they're obligated to have sex uh, with the person that buys them. And they don't realize that um, it's up to the girl whether or not they have sex. They don't have to have sex if somebody buys them drinks or or drugs. They are allowed to say no. They don't have to say yes. Um, so that would be something that could be taught in the communities. Uh, another thing that is common sense that could, they could, that could help a woman not um, have unprotected sex is to watch their drinks, obviously, when they go out. 
Um, we recommend that they have a buddy system, maybe have both both two BFFs be together and they watch each other's drinks when they go to the washroom or they could decide that one person could be just like um, drink, 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 drinking and driving. It'd be kind of the same principle. You could also maybe take turns being the sober one and they could make sure that both of them get home. And the other thing is to make sure that you leave enough money for the cab, ro cab ride home so that you don't have to be uh, short of money and you know, you, you're, you're sh assured of having a safe way of getting home. And another uh, good discussion topic is to have ask your elders to talk about um, sex in sex in your culture, about respecting your body. A good um, cultural practice is to ask your elders about it. And um, one of the good one of the good resources that we had was um, in our video, Our Children, Our Future. Um, to Chief Dolores Pollard, um, the former Heisla chief, she had a really good saying about it. She said, uh, learn about your body, learn how it works, and respect your body. One thing that we learned about is two-spirited. Um, the coalition was invited uh, to a two-spirited workshop because working with HIV for nine years, I always heard the word two-spirited uh, talked about, and I didn't realize what it meant. What it is is that um, two-spirited is different than um, the gay person of today. Like today, a gay person, that's their sexual preference. But two-spirited is actually means their role in society, which is totally different than what I thought. It's not a big surprise that Native uh, culture was oppressed when the residential school was, um, was brought on to our people, as well as colonization. We lost a lot of our cultural practices from colonization. Um, and one of those cultural practices was uh, two-spirited. Back then, um, two-spirited people, it was, what it means is that um, the person learned both the male and female role. So the male role was to hunt, hunt, gather, hunt, gather, protect the community and build. And the female's uh, role was to clean, cook, and take care of the children. So the two-spirited means that they learned both of those roles. And back, back then, before, um, before we were colonized, uh, the two-spirited were actually um, respected like the current chiefs of today. And they used to be kind of like the family services because they would take in the, the sick or the orphaned kids from the community and they would take care of them and they would accept gifts from the other, uh, from the community to take care of them. That is our presentation for hepatitis C. So if you want to know more about hepatitis C, you could go see your doctor or your community or most walk-in clinics or educators or health program leads, which are gonna be uh, shown. Next, um, we're gonna have a closing song by Rosa Ancora McIntosh. Thank you and have a great day.